Why did I see a colony of minions down there? Oh, hi minions. Did I scare you with my big beautiful eyes? Don't be. Because life is full of surprises waiting for you to discover. And if you are observant enough and curious like a scientist, you will discover many things that you can ever imagine. Sorry. All right, welcome everyone to MRT Primary School Science Carnival Online 2020. If you are excited to know what's up for today, can you give me a big thumbs up? Oh, great. Let's see what's the program for you today. Now, we need everyone to turn off your video and mic yourself. Sorry. All right, to start off the day, three fun loving premise for pupils from Innovation Club will be sharing with you how they use fruits to play a piano tune. Strange, huh? You'll find out how. Next, you will be virtually brought into the world of marine and coastal organisms. Our guest speaker from the National Parks Board will give you a very interesting talk about environmental conservation and the rich biodiversity within the Little Red Dot. After that, it's time for you to hone your creativity. We have a hands-on upcycling activity awaiting for you. Last but not least, how can we end it without showcasing some of the outstanding science projects by Admiralty Primary School students? Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome our Innovation Club's Team Coders. Well, this dynamic team is really amazing. They represented our school to take part in the National Science Busters Festival 2020 and has now emerged the final round in the competition. Let's take a look at the video they have submitted in the finals first. I have an apple. I have a banana. Apple pie and banana cake. Hey, Tu Hong, let's make banana cake. Yeah. Ugh. A banana? Guys, why, why are we making banana cake? Remember last time we made an app, a piano out of apples? This time we're using bananas. Do you know how? We make the fruits produce music by connecting one part of the alligator wire to the sensor of the cookboard and the other side of the alligator wire to the fruit itself and the another alligator wire connected to the ground of the cookboard and just by either holding the other side of the alligator wire just by tapping it, it will produce sounds just by using the right hood. When you touch the fruit, Electricity flows through the fruit, through us, and back to the cork board. Since we conduct electricity, once you hold the wire and also touch the fruit at the same time, it makes it produce music. Now I am going to play you a tune. <laughs> But do you know what makes them conductive? It is the moisture in them. Conductive materials are anything which can conduct electricity. Some examples include metal, water, and our bodies. On the other hand, wood, paper, glass, plastic, and rubber. All these types of materials are non-conductive. So this is the float programming. For the quick board, when you touch the apples, the piano music will be produced from the laptop. When we are touching the apples and the ground wire at the same time, we are closing the circuit. Our bodies are conductive due to the moisture inside us. This is the website at music.strawbees.com. I hold the ground wire and touch the apples at the same time. 
apple and banana are conductive materials as they have moisture in them. Our bodies are also conductive as we are mostly made of water. Aluminum foil is another material as it allows electricity to pass through it. So how do you explain how piano constructed out of aluminum works? So the computer marks the start of the and then it gets into five different wires. Four wires going into each key, and then one wire for all. Which is what I'm doing now. And as we touch the individual key, you see some pupils going away, sir. Okay, they have participated in the science class. We complete the energy that we transfer to this wire, which will be transferred back to the quote box and back to the key. We had a lot of fun making pianos with aluminium and also the fruits. We hope you have enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching. Little fun things such as coding. Based on that, we also sent for competitions like a science buses competition for which we are representing this project from our school for. So, what is our project about? Well, the project is a very thought provoking one about coding. Here, with the help of code bots, and the conductive materials such as fruits and aluminum foil, we are going to produce music. We'll be showing you how we do so later with the cobalt programming. So, uh, there's a sign behind the piano, which is the, to the piano you saw over there. So it works similar to a light bulb circuit, uh, and it's a sliding modified circuit in the piano. Like this. Okay, so number one, we have uh, electric sends electricity to the cobalt via a USB cable. Then then the ground and sensor wires are connected to the yes, back of the wheel. The ground wires connected to the outer hole and the, the eyes of the cobalt. The sensor is connected to the inner hole of the cobalt. We'll be showing you what it is later. And we that because the ground connected object and the sensor connected object. Then our, over here, our body acts like a wire as we conduct electricity. But why do we conduct electricity? It's due to moisture inside us. Lastly, the circuit is powered from the sensor connector of that object that we touch, will raise the laptop to the cardboard, hence making the laptop to produce music, and it closes the circuit. So this is what, uh, this is the thing, this is the diagram. So you can connect uh, the sensor to the inner hole of the front pad, which is the front of the cardboard. Or for the ground, you can connect it to the back pad, which is the back of the cord board, to the outer hole of the back pad, or the eyes, as you can see over here. So this is a diagram on how you can touch with the elevator clips. This is also a diagram about where the ground and the center is. So when you touch the hand by hand, you, you can make it as a ground, the electricity passes through you and you touch back the sensor uh, which can be connected to another material, a uh, conductive material or yourself to, uh, to close the circuit and uh, in turn and uh, produce music from the laptop when it's connected to the US, when the cookbook is connected to the USB cable. So how can fruits be used to conduct electricity? So fruits are conductive because they are mostly made up of water. So water is the main factor for making materials conductive. So some other examples of conductive materials are our bodies. So you remember like how 
Last time I told you that our body has moisture, that's why we are conductive. Electricity will travel through the moisture. And below is the list of conductive and non-conductive materials. So conductive materials are anything which allow electricity to travel through them. Examples of conductive materials include water and our bodies. This is because we are mostly made up of water. On the other hand, there are non-conductive materials such as wood, paper, glass, plastic and rubber as they do not allow electricity to pass through them. As they are not mostly made up of water. So is there any difference if you use citrus fruits like lemon? So over here, water is not the only factor to make things conductive. Acids are also another one. So over here, lemons are high in citric acid, so citrus fruits work quite better than normal fruits, meaning they conduct a little, they're better, a little bit better conductors than normal fruits. Okay, so our journey. So our journey. Okay, uh, like, uh, now I, I, I to pass to Chung. Uh, now I'll be showing you how I paste the copper tape over here. Now I will be uh, showing you how I stick copper tape over here onto this black box to make an instrument. So over here, you use the copper tape. You just peel it off this and then you can stick it onto the the instrument like this so so we will be testing now uh, the, uh, uh, i have the code bottle here Uh, yeah, even me, I'm not trying to do it. Maybe you can try it. This for bot. Yeah. Okay, this is for bot.
am going to find the other. Thank uh-huh. 
Thank you, decoders and deco. I think it takes a lot of courage to be here presenting for you. So let's wish them all the best in their competition. know that as a small yet diverse nation lying within one to two degrees of the equator, Singapore has many ecosystems within just a small little bit. Our guest speaker, Ms. Cho Pei Rong from MHUBS, will now share with you some of these special marine ecosystems and what we can do to help conserve them. Over to you, Ms. Cho. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Pei Rong. Today I'm going to share with you some of the interesting marine life that we have in Singapore. So I'm going to introduce you to this area called the intertidal area. It's pronounced as intertidal. It refers to the coastal zone between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide mark. So this is an area that's home to a variety of marine life. So some unstudied habitats include the rocky shores, the sandy beaches, seagrass meadows, and because the animals are exposed to both water when it's high tide, and also they are exposed to the air when it's low tide, these intertidal areas are one of the most stressful environments for animals to live in. So that's why the animals have ad adopted coping mechanisms to survive these harsh, harsh conditions. So in Singapore, we have two high tides and two low tides each day, and we usually explore the intertidal areas during the low tide. And habitats, are the homes where the plants and the animals live in 
So today we're going to explore some of the intertidal habitats in Singapore. First up, we have our intertidal reef and rubble. So you've heard of coral reefs, and when the reef, some of these corals die, they make up coral rubble. So these are homes to animals as well. And this is a shore that we, one of the islands that we have in Singapore, in the southern part of Singapore. And there we have soft corals, hard corals, and anemones. We also have this very interesting animal called the giant clam. Giant clam, um, there's this con misconception of giant clam that they are man-eaters. So they were once thought to be legendary, legendary land man-eaters. So a man actually got stuck. His leg got stuck while trying to get a pole from the giant clam. So people think that giant clam can trap sea divers in the grip of its shell. And some people call them the killer clams trapping and drowning the divers. But so far, nobody has ever died or got trapped by a giant clam. So it's not true that giant clams are man-eaters. So this is a giant clam. You see this area over here, it has two shells. And this area over here is the mantle. And this fleshy part is colored due to these animals that live in them. They are called the zooxanthellae. So they are photosynthetic animals that provide the giant clam with their food source. And giant clams are also an important source of food for other animals such as fishes, snails, sea stars, crabs, and octopus. They also provide shelter for other animals. And this animal over here living in our coral reef and rubble is the nudie brank. So this Part over here is the naked gills. That's why they are called the nudie brang. So they use these gills to breathe with, with these feathery external gills that they have on their back. And this polka dot nudie brang feeds on sponges. And we also can see black tip reef shark lurking in our waters. And sharks are predators. They are apex predators and they hunt for food. But in Singapore, these sharks are often quite shy, so if you do see them, they will usually swim away from you. When animals are brightly coloured, it sometimes can mean that they are either poisonous or venomous. So poisonous means if you eat the animal, you will either get a really bad diarrhea or you might die from it. Venomous, on the other hand, means that if the animal has a stinging cell or stinging on spine, when it, when it injects you with the venom, you might feel a lot of pain or you might die from it. So this particular crab is called the mosaic reef crab. It is poisonous. That means that when you eat it, uh, you, you might die from it. So it's, the mosaic reef crab has toxins which are not destroyed even after cooking. So if you do see it, you definitely cannot eat this particular crab. The next habitat we explore is the mangroves. You can see the mangroves have very interesting roots that helps them to stabilize themselves on the mangrove and it also helps them to breathe in the waterlogged muddy environment. This is a giant mud skipper that can be found at Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve. The mud skipper is able to live outside of the water but sometimes have to go back to the water to exchange the water in order for it to breathe. And we also have rocky shores in Singapore. This is taken at the Labrador Nature Reserve, our last remaining natural rocky shore habitat in Singapore. And on rocky shores, although it looks like they have a lot of rocks, lots of animals live on them as well. And some of these animals hide underneath the rocks or they have interesting uh, mechanisms to help cope with the, the rocky shore environment. So you see here, these are barnacles. These are limpets, and there are lots and lots of snails. And this particular snail here has this little trap door. It's called the operculum. So it helps the snail to hide when it's, when it's dry and to prevent their predators from reaching them. Can you see something over here? This is actually the, sto uh, the, st the stonefish. The stonefish is so well camouflaged that normally you don't see them 
unless you're very, very, very observant. So the stonefish has spines on its back, and if you step on them, the spines will pierce through your sole of the, your shoes and inject venom into your, into your foot. It can be very, very painful. We also have mud flats in Singapore, and this was taken at Chek Jawa of Pulau Ubin. So although it looks quite bare on the surface, lots and lots of animals actually live in our mud flats. And sandy beaches are also filled with life. So this was taken at East Coast Park. And if you see those little bumps over here, these are actually animals. They are called the sand dollars. So this is a sand dollar. It's usually buried in the sand. And they belong to a group of animals called the echinoderms. It comes from the Greek word, spiny skin. So the sand dollar has, has a mouth on its underside at the center, and they feed on little, tiny little organisms in the sand. And they're called sand dollars because they're really round, and when they're dead, they leave this little test that's bleached by the sand and looks like big silver coins. And sometimes when you go to our beaches, you see these big barrels, they're about this size. And these are actually made from this animal called the ghost crab. The ghost crab has its name because one minute you see it, the next minute you don't because they run really, really, really fast. This is an adult ghost crab. The juveniles, which are the smaller ghost crabs, they look a little bit different. They resemble the background that they live in. So this is called camouflage, a type of camouflage called background matching. So we have also observed that the animals sometimes change a bit of color, these crabs. So they become lighter in the day to match the background and they become darker at night. This is to improve the camouflage uh, against the sand that they live on. And sometimes you see these very interesting crabs with one bigger pincer. These are called the fiddler crabs. So the male fiddler crab will wave its enlarged pincer to attract the females. And the females do not have this bigger pincer. So the females have the same size pincers, while the males have one enlarged pincer to attract the females. We have two species of horseshoe crabs in Singapore. One is the coastal horseshoe crab that you see here, and the other one is the mangrove horseshoe crab. So these horseshoe crabs look very, very ancient because um, some people call them the living fossils. So they haven't changed their shape for over millions of years. And the horseshoe crab has got blue blood. And it's because instead of iron that we have in our blood, which makes our blood red, the horseshoe crab has copper-based blood. And people use their blood to test for bacteria toxins in medicine and drugs. So horseshoe crabs mate in pairs, so sometimes you do spot them in pairs, and this is called an amplexus when they come in pairs. The male which is smaller than the female is the one on top, while the female is the one at the bottom. Also in Singapore, we find seagrass meadows, very rich in life as well. So seagrasses are plants, and like plants, they have leaves, they have fruits, they have roots, they have flowers, and they have shoots as well. This is also another species of seagrass called the fern seagrass. And these are the flowers of the tape seagrass. And living in the seagrass habitat, uh, we have lots of snails. This one over here is a moon snail that is burrowing into the sand. So these moon snail, they hunt for other snails and clams, and they rest underneath the sand. And the moon snail live, lay their eggs in this little round thing over here called the sand collar. So if you do see them, please don't pick them up because they actually mix their eggs with the sand to make this particular sand collar. And this snail over here is called the kawi. So kawis are used to be used as a currency in some countries and parts of the world in the past, in Asia, Africa, Oceania, and some places in Europe. 
and the shell is so smooth and shiny because of the mantle, which is the flesh, it will cover and envelope its shell to prevent other animals from growing on it and to prevent algae from growing on it. And this animal over here that's burrowing into the sand, it's called the weasel olive snail. It is also a predator as well. It feeds on other snails, small crustaceans, as well as they scavenge for dead, dead animals that they can be found on the sandy shore. And animals sometimes don't live alone. They sometimes live together. Here you see an olive whelk over here living with a snail hitching anemone. So the anemone is hitching on the snail to get better access to food sources, while the snail would scavenge around and gain protection from the anemone because the anemones have stinging cells. And this beautiful animal over here is the carnivorous marine snail called the Nobovolute. Hermit crabs can be spotted in Singapore as well. This is the orange striped hermit crab. And this is the tidal hermit crab. And for hermit crabs, they are not true crabs. And what happens is if they lose their shell, they will actually die outside of their shell. And when they grow bigger, they need to move to another shell that's bigger. So basically they have to move, shift to a new house. So shells are important homes for hermit crabs. So we often encourage people not to pick up their shells because that might deprive some of the hermit crabs from their homes. So the other animals that we often spot is the sea star. So this is a painted sand star. And sea stars usually have five arms and they're carnivorous and they hunt for clams, snails and little creatures that are buried in the sand. This is the common sea star, but unfortunately, unlike its name, it is not so common anymore. This is the knobbly sea star. And for knobbly sea stars, they are really interesting because the arrangement of the knobs and the size of the color and the, of the knobs, it's like our own fingerprint, like our thumbprint. So every individual knobbly sea star has a different arrangement of their knobs. So you can actually tell that individual. So this one's different, so is this one, and every single individual looks different. And not all sea stars have five arms. Some of them have more than five arms. And some of them have even eight arms. This is the eight arm Ludia sea star. And over here, it's a brittle star. So the five arms of the brittle star is attached to a central aura disc and it's very, very fast moving. They are called brittle stars because the arms are very brittle and they fall apart. They drop off to confuse their predators so that they can escape. And over here, this strange looking animal, usually found in deeper waters in Singapore, it's called a basket star. It's highly branched and the fleshy arms look like baskets. So they feed on microscopic tiny little organisms called zooplankton. And the mouth is actually on the underside of the central disc over here. And this alien looking like animal is also belonging to the echinoderm group. This is called the feather star. So it looks a bit lily like and they feed on little plankton in the water as well. So what you see are all the arms that are moving. Here's another photo of another brittle, uh, feather star. So this one over here has been washed up on the shore, so it's trying to, to move back into the water. And we also have sea urchins, also a family of the sea stars and sea cucumbers. And at the bottom over here, this is the underside of the sea urchin. 
This is where the sea urchin's mouth is and it uses it to feed. And it grazes on algae and seaweed. Sea cucumbers can also be found on our shores. This is the garlic bread sea cucumber, the sea apple sea cucumber, this is the wati sea cucumber, this is the thorny sea cucumber, and this one over here is our octopus. So octopus, octopuses have eight legs and or arms, and they are one of the most intelligent invertebrates. Invertebrates are animals without backbone. So they have really excellent eyesight and a very well-developed brain for, for an invertebrate by invertebrate standards. And they're really, really intelligent. They're masters of camouflage and they can control their arms and their suckers independently. So they change color and the texture of their skin to match the background of uh, where they live. So this one over here is trying to to hide itself, but because the, the burrow is a bit too small, so it's trying to grab onto little rocks and rubble to cover itself so that it wouldn't be spotted by us. Sometimes they also use shells to hide in those shells so that they wouldn't be spotted by other animals. And this one over here is displaying a little bit of aggression because it is actually protecting its eggs that the octopus, the mother octopus has laid in this little glass bottle here, a broken glass bottle. A relative of the Octopus is the cuttlefish. Like the octopus, the cuttlefish can also change its colors and texture to look like it matches the background. Sometimes on the intertidal area, we find little puddles of tidal pools, and there we find um, seahorses that are hiding in our, our waters. And they are still alive here, they're not dead, they're just resting. So they hide in the tide pools for a while, and once the tide comes back in, when it's high tide, the, the seahorses can then swim away. So seahorses are very interesting because the males are the ones that get pregnant, so we call them the pregnant papas. The females will deposit the eggs in the male's pouch over here. This is the pouch of the male. And then the males will fertilize the eggs as they enter the pouch and eat and incubate them until they are born as tiny little baby seahorses. And the family of the seahorse, a relative of the seahorse is the pipefish. Like the seahorse, the pipefish, the, the males are the ones that will carry the eggs of the females. So this is a carpet anemone, and as you can see over here, there are two anemone shrimps that live among the carp anemone. So sometimes anemones are excellent homes for other fishes and prawns and shrimps that gain protection from the anemone by living amongst the anemone. The sun over here is an underwater shot of a carpet anemone shrimp. This is a spiky sea pen. And sea pens are relative to the anemones and the corals as well. And as you can see here, there's a little crab that's also living among the sea pen. So the crab gains protection by, from, by the sea pen by living in the sea pen. So let me introduce you to this program that we get volunteers and the general public to help collect data. Some of, on some of the intertidal animals that we have on the shore. It is now 6 a.m. We are gearing up while waiting for low tide before we start our intertidal watch survey. Intertidal watch is a 
citizen science program where volunteers like us actually take part to conduct surveys at low tide areas along our Singapore shores to monitor the marine biodiversity and then the data is actually collected by NPARCS for research and conservation purpose. So in a team of five, uh, we'll observe and see what are the marine habitats that around the area. And then within each group, there will be one data recorder, seekers, and one photographer. So my father takes pictures of our sightings and he's usually the frame guy who will decide out the sample area that we'll be surveying. He does everything except for recording on the data sheet because we cannot read his handwriting. I actually identify them and then record them into the data sheets. Baby, she's quite good at spotting the different species. Yeah, she's sharp enough to spot them. We were actually set up in different tidal zones from low, medium, high and then within each of the zone, each of the team will actually lay out the transact tape of 25 meters and then we will actually set up five different quadrants. Based on the computer generated data points, we will go out and uh, place the quadrants based on those points then we will monitor the marine life there. Although Singapore is an urban city-state, we realise that there's a lot of uh, nature around us. Through this intertidal watch, we realise that we can raise the awareness on the marine biodiversity as well as promote conservation uh, in our Singapore shores. During our intertidal watch surveys, we get to see a diversity of marine life. So there are some creatures that we usually see, which is the sea archie and the sea cucumber. My husband is a nature lover, so we wanted to do something meaningful together as a family. Plus, I wanted uh, Phoebe to move away from the mobile devices to appreciate the nature in Singapore. So this program is definitely a very good experience for the family. And now, because of this program, I mean, Phoebe is now definitely more aware of the nature around her. So now she's actually part of the school science club. I've learned about the impact of trash on marine life. Once we tried to entangle a crab from a fishing net, it's during such encounters when you realise how fragile marine life is. Therefore, we need to do everything we can to conserve every single bit of our marine life. So the objective of this program is to document and monitor the biodiversity, which are the plants and the animals and the habitats on our intertidal areas. So to monitor means to investigate and to collect scientific data over time. So here we engage citizen scientists and by citizen science it means you don't have to be a scientist in order to help us do the science and collect data. So everyone and anyone can help to collect the data. So we still follow a scientific method that you saw just now in the video. So um, all the volunteers and citizen scientists follow a specific method to help collect the data and they count all the marine life that they see uh, the sea stars, the sea cucumbers, the, they count the, the seaweed and the seagrass as well. And why do we want to monitor the marine life? So it's important to document what we have so that we know what we, can, we need to protect. And everything changes over time, especially in the marine environment. And every day when you go down there, it can look very different. So you never will see the exact same thing, even if you go to the same spot on different days. And there is no definite answer to all these natural phenomena uh, in science. And that's why scientists, like the citizen scientists here, we use evidence collected to explain why these areas are changing over time and to see whether there are any patterns, to predict patterns. And from there, we can see if some of the marine environment or the habitats might have some impact due to, say, pollution or due to development then we can use the data that we have collected to help explain the phenomena. And not just that, uh, by monitoring the shore and the biodiversity, we can also see whether if they change over time and whether we need to take action to do something to protect them. So that's why we need to continuously gather the data and use these evidence to support what we do. And the surveys will help to inform all our management and decisions that we do at NPACS to help conserve and protect our marine life in Singapore. So in the interest of time, I won't go into this, but you can think about a word to describe what marine life in Singapore means to you now after listening to this talk. And 
And so what can you do to help us conserve and protect our shores? Uh, in Singapore, a lot of people are not very connected to nature because we live in such an urbanized area. But actually, our shores are just a little short walk or short distance or short drive or public transport away from, from where we live. So you can visit our shore, explore our intertidal areas and the beaches using our boardwalks that we have at Sungai Bulo, Chek Jawa and many other areas, Pasar Reef too. And if you do, are able to join intertidal walks, you can sign up for intertidal walks at the Sisters Island Marine Park or Chek Jawa or other places. And if you are visiting the intertidal area, go in small groups because we don't want to have too many people trampling on the intertidal area because that can cause an uh, impact. So trampling and stepping on the intertidal area can actually cause an impact and harm on the marine animals too. So be careful of where you step and don't pick up the animals if possible. You can also bring your friends and family along and you can share your photos online. You can use this uh, app called SG Bio Atlas. You can ask your parents to take photos of them and marine animals and you can upload it onto SG Bio Atlas. This is a mobile app can be downloaded on, from both Apple App Store as well as Google Play. And you can also help by not littering because waste and litter can have a very harmful effect on our shore. So you can help in joining coastal cleanups. Lots of coastal cleanup happening along our beaches these days. And these are some of the do's and don'ts. So you can check out uh, some of the sites by the Public Hygiene Council or this one over here by small change. And you can also, when, when you're of a certain age, you can also volunteer with MPACs or some of our blue groups. So you can visit our volunteer homepage on the MPACs homepage. And as an individual, you can also start by loving the earth and live more sustainably. So things like bring your own shopping bag instead of getting a plastic bag, Try to reduce your use of plastic bag. Reuse your plastic bag a few times before you throw them away. And bring your own food containers if you can. Carry a reusable water bottle instead of buying, um, buying water from plastic bottles. You can pack your lunch in a box. Bring your own cup. Dine in, if, if possible, after this whole COVID period. And say no to disposable straws and avoid very heavily packaged food. You can share all these messages with some of your friends and other family members as well. And like what Sir David Attenborough said very aptly, no one will protect what they don't care about, and no one will care about what they have never experienced. And I would like you to think about how do you want to play your part to help protect and conserve our marine life in Singapore. This, thank you very much. And I hope you can join us in conserving our marine life in Singapore. Thank you. Are there any questions? If we have some time for questions. Children, if you have any questions, all right, children, if you have any questions, you may raise your hand and your teacher can choose you to come forward and you can on your video to ask a question. We do not have a lot of time, but uh, if you have question, we can. I think Miss Cho can take like one or two questions. Okay. Okay, I guess there's no questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to let your teachers know and we will ask uh, Ms. Cho on behalf and we'll let the school know.
All right, now let's move on to our next segment. Okay. Reusing trash and turning it into a brand new product is what we call upcycling. Do you want to activate your mind and your hands now? I'm going to pass the time to Mr. Ang, who will teach you how to upcycle old foul plastic materials into useful mass wallet. Mr. Ang, please. Okay, good morning, boys and girls. Uh, right now, we are going to okay, have a short little task for you. Okay, hold on for a while. This is strong. I need to share. Can you share the slides? Yes. Okay, teachers, while waiting, uh, you can adjust the volume as well as to give out the materials. Each of you should receive a piece of uh, of a plastic file or a folder, as well as a key ring. Okay, to make sure you have your plastic file or folder and a key ring, okay, before we move on to the next task. Okay, from what uh, Ms. Pei Rong shared with us this morning, I think that we know that there are a right variety of biodiversity or marine animals around, the, uh, around Singapore. Although we are such a small country, but yet we can see that there are so such a diverse range of life. And uh, some of the things I have never encountered and, or even expected to find in Singapore. Okay, because they are like what uh, Ms. Pei Rong said as well, it is such an urbanized area. We only see HDB flats, we see streets, land, we see roads. But, there, but yet again, nature is all around us. And we must do our part because we want to live harmoniously with the nature that is around us. Okay, so uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, let's let's look at the pictures here on the screen. You can see that there is a lot of litter that is on the beach as well as in the water, right? But the question we ask ourselves is, how did the litter actually end up there? Okay, and uh, if you think that this is not happening in Singapore, okay, let me go on. Okay, as you can see, yeah, the picture on the left is actually a picture that is taken in Pongo. And the picture on the right is uh, taken at East Coast Park, a very popular park. And you can see that the problem, although not as serious, is also present in Singapore. And with this problem, it is affecting the marine life. Right? Those wonderful, interesting creatures that you have seen from uh, Ms. Pei Rong sharing earlier on. Okay, so just a quick question before we continue. By right? using your fingers, you can show whether uh, which of these uh, is the biggest source of marine litter, right? Is it litter thrown inland? Could it be uh, some a plastic container I throw in Admiralty Primary School? Could it have ended up in the ocean, okay? Uh, could it be litter thrown from ships or beach goers when they go, like for example, East Coast Park, they will then throw the, the, the litter over there, right? Which of these actually contributed the most to the amount of litter that you see over there? Right, with your fingers, you can raise them up. One, two, or three. 
Okay, in fact, all of these are sources of marine litter. But what is surprising is actually the biggest source comes from the litter that is thrown inland. That means the ones that we throw, that, that were thrown uh, in, on our streets, even near the MRT station, even in the CBD, the Central Business District, right, even in our offices, our schools, right, these contributed the most to the amount of marine litter over there. That's why we have a very heavy responsibility to cut down on this little problem as well as to protect the biodiversity of, the, uh, of Singapore. Okay, let me move on to the next slide. Okay, so how did they end up there actually? If you can see from this diagram that uh, most of the, the sources that contributed to marine litter, they're actually from our cities, from inland. Right, you can see if a rubbish bin that's overflowing, some of the litter could be washed away by rain, could be washed away by some water on the surface into drains, and then it could also contribute, and then it could actually dig its way all, all the way down to the ocean. Okay, uh, in Singapore, of course, before they are, this litter is being released, we do treat them. We do make sure that we, uh, anything that we can capture and prevent them from flowing into the sea, we will do that. But however, there are also some things such as microplastics that are so small that we are not able to, uh, to filter them before they leave and then they end up in the ocean. Okay, and of course, uh, just now we talked about uh, when people go to the beach, yeah, they do litter as well as litter that is thrown in the ships. All these contributed to the litter that you see in the ocean. Okay, and what does this mean to the animals? Right, if you can see from these pictures here, a plastic bag, a very common marine litter. Actually, to a turtle, they may not be able to tell the difference. So you can see from here that this is evidence. Right, if a plastic bag floating in water looks exactly like a jellyfish that they like to eat, and they end up consuming a lot of these plastic bags. Okay, other effects include trapping them. Right, if you look at this turtle over here, when it was young, it was trapped in this uh, package container or this uh, is used to store cartons of uh, cans, I think. And when it grew, it did not, it wasn't able to develop well. Okay, and so these are the effects, the real effects of litter that can, that actually take, that will have an impact on marine animals. On the right, you will see that there is a lot of fragments of plastic, okay, that the fish has actually consumed. Okay, so when, when fishes eat, most of them, they just enter the, uh, open their mouth and let all the food flow in. So when it happened that uh, some of these plastic pieces entered the digestive system, they remain there. Okay, and sometimes, we're, increasingly, we are seeing that when we eat fish, some fishes, they still have this plastic in them and it could end up being into our digestive system. So these are the dangerous impacts on marine animals that uh, we, we see, right? If the littering is not uh, reduced, okay? And this year, right, one of the major events, COVID-19, okay? Do you spot any new sources of litter in this photo? Right, if you, are, if you, are, if you observe that there is a mask here, a disposable mask, you are right, yes? And uh, of course, in some places as well, gloves, right? These are common disposables used during the COVID-19 period, okay? And when not discarded off properly, they end up in the ocean, okay? And then, like what we have uh, discussed earlier about the impact, this could then cause some animals, some marine animals to eat them unknowingly, or some fishes could be trapped in a glove, and then that will cause them not to be able to swim around or even they can suffocate inside a plastic bag or a plastic glove. Okay, so this year, we are with a task for you and that is to make a mask wallet using the plastic folder and a key ring that you are given. Okay, so if, the, uh, if teachers, uh, if it's still on the teacher's table, please help to pass down the materials. Okay, 
So what is this task about? Okay, upcycling, I want Mrs. Chong has mentioned to you earlier, is to, we are going to reuse old files and folders. In fact, okay, none of the files and folders that you receive are bought. They are all donated by your teachers as well as the staff from Admiralty Primary. Okay, so we are reusing them because they no longer have any purpose. So don't need to cut up all your, don't need to go and purchase a new file just for this purpose, okay? That's not the spirit of upcycling. Upcycling is to reuse what, has, what is no longer in use, okay? And we want this to be something that can help you remember today, right? The talk that you had, right? And to also keep your mask in a hygienic manner and not to cause any litter of it. Right, sometimes when we eat, we may place our mask on the table, which is not only unhygienic, but it also, uh, there could be instances where the wind can blow your mask away and it ends up being litter. Okay, so we want to prevent that. And last but not least, right, we chose the old files and folders because not only is it reusable, we, we can clean them because they are plastic, it's waterproof, you can wash them. And also I know some of you, when you are, keeping your mask, you use Ziploc bags or plastic bags, okay? And that is also one of the most common source or most common item found uh, in uh, when they do coaster cleanups, okay? So we want to reduce the use of these single bag, single use bags and we have something that we can use it again and again, okay? But just for today, when you're in class, please do not take off your mask, okay? I know you are very excited to try the mask wallet but if you, you can only do so if you have another mask or use it at another time, okay? Maybe at home, okay? Or when you're having your meal later on. All right, so I will just go through some of the steps with you. I will run through it twice so uh, you can follow the instructions. Uh, step one to about four, they are actually done for you because uh, of time and uh, we do not want, and then of course some of you may not have scissors and all that. Okay, but I know some of you, maybe this could be something that you want to do during the September holidays to make for your family members, or you can make more for your friends. Okay, so what, is, what has been done for you, step one, is that a piece of the flow folder has been cut. Okay, so the recommended dimension is 21 cm by 10 cm. Okay, although uh, as long as it's big enough to hold a mask, it is big enough. Okay, that is good enough. Okay, but make sure that it's flexible because you need to fold it. Okay, some of your files, like your subject files, math, science files, they, if you fold it, it will break. So it's not flexible enough and we want to choose one that is flexible. Okay, step two, after cutting, you will have sharp edges. So uh, we have also rounded off the edges for you uh, by using a pair of scissors or a corner cutter. Just to ensure, check your plastic sheet now and make sure there are no sharp edges around. Right after that, um, well, we, we are going to fold it later on and uh, we have helped you to punch holes on the sides, okay? This is an optional step, okay? The key ring is optional, but we, for this purpose, this, this task, we will actually have it for you, okay? We will, we will provide the key ring for you to make it like a souvenir, okay, of uh, today's of Science Carnival. Okay, so that has been what is done for you. Now it is your turn. Okay, your turn for step five is to put the key ring into the hole. So first, fold it and align the two holes that has been punched such that you can see through the hole. Then slowly put in the key ring. How to put in the key ring? Well, you can either use your fingers or a ruler to pry open the, the ring and slot it into the two holes. Okay, this may take some time, so uh, try it on your own and uh, please help each other if you are done earlier. Okay, this step will require patience and please be careful do not use sharp objects to pry the, the key ring open. Just use, maybe you can use a ruler or you can slot in, slot one, one side of the plastic sheet first and then you can slot in the other one later.
Okay, if you are doing this on your own, just know that this step is optional, but it will make the structure of the mask wallet stronger. Okay, then you have uh, something that you can view, reuse for a longer period of time. Are you able to get the key ring into the holes? If you are, please help your neighbors on your left and right. Okay, some of you may already be able to get the key ring into the holes. Uh, I will come back to this step later. Okay, right now, uh, for those of you who have finished, uh, we will continue with the rest of it. Actually, it is just how to use the mask wallet. Okay, so I'll give you some, a bit more time. If you are not able to fit the key ring in, uh, it's okay. You can do it later. You can even do it as the last step. Okay, but now it's to teach you how to use the mask wallet. Okay, so I want you to settle down. Okay, put your mask wallet on the table and look up. Fold your arms and get ready. Okay, now I'll go through and review the instructions how to use the mask wallet to keep your mask. Right, very importantly, you need to know how to fold your mask, okay? You should not let the, if you look over here, the black portion, right? The, this is the, the part that actually touches your face. You should not let that part touch the mask wallet, okay? So what you can do, you are supposed to fold the mask into a quarter. Okay, but you must ensure that this part that touches your face does not touch the mask wallet. Okay, so you can follow the instructions here, right? Using the, on the length, the longer side of the mask that you have. Okay, remember, do not take off your mask. If you have a different one, if you have a separate one, you can use it to try. Or if not, you just uh, remember the instructions. It's quite easy to follow. Okay, so on the, the longer side of the mask, fold it in half. Okay, as you can see in this part of the diagram here. Secondly, fold it again. Yeah, make sure that only the outer surface of the mask is exposed. So you should not be able to touch the inner part of your mask. Okay, so this is very important. You don't want to contaminate your mask. You want it to be, you want it to be clean. And uh, that's what the mask wallet is for. It will help to keep your mask wallet clean, not to dirty it. Okay, so once you are able to fold it into a quarter, you can slot it into your mask wallet. Okay, slot into your mask wallet. And the final step is to then take the mask strings and tie it around the wallet such that it will then be tight. Okay, a tip for you here. You should ensure that the strings of the mask are parallel to the folded part. So if you look at the diagram here, this is the folded part of the mask wallet, right? It should be parallel, right? If you, if you fold it and tie it the other way, your mask wallet could open up. Okay, so ensure that it is parallel so that you have a tighter wrap around the wallet. Okay, are you able to have your mask wallet done. Okay, I know some of you, you may not be able to try it, but uh, just remember, you need to fold your mask into a quarter and then wrap, uh, after you inserted the mask into the mask wallet, you need to wrap the, the mask strings around the mask wallet. Okay, 
So now I know some of you are at different different steps. So some of you may already be at this step. Some of you still inserting your key ring. I will go through the instructions one more, once more. And of course, these instructions will also be shared with you on SLS. So if you forget any steps, you can always refer to SLS uh, to, to make your own mask wallet. Okay, so starting from the top, right, we first cut out an uh, unused folder. Okay, usually it's the back of it where it is strong enough, but at the same time flexible. Then we round off the corners to make sure there are no sharp corners. After that, we fold it into half. Punch holes for a key ring. This step is optional. Insert the key ring into the holes. This is the most difficult step. I hope you are successful at this point. You know, later during HSB, you can continue. Fold your, wall, fold your mask such that the outer surface is the only, only the outer surface is exposed. So your, the part that touches your face should not touch the mask wallet. Okay, slot in your mask wallet and wrap the strings around to tighten it. So you have a, a mask wallet that is tight. Okay, and uh, this step you can continue during HSB or at home, right? Um, you can use permanent markers, stickers, your correction tape to decorate and personalize your mask wallet. Okay, so you can use this when you go out to eat, uh, even in the canteen, right? but do remember, okay? Do remember that we are making this mask wallet to remind ourselves that marine litter Okay, this is affecting the marine life around us. And we want to prevent this and other sources of litter as well. So not only our masks where we need to take good care of, other things like plastic bags, dispose them properly because they may end up in the ocean and they may end up, even if they don't end up in the ocean, they could also uh, be mistaken by the animals around us in our neighborhood and that could also affect their lives. Okay, so we are going to give you a challenge for Science Carnival. Okay, so if you are not able to finish your mask, uh, I would like you to settle down. Okay, keep your mask and your mask wallet. Now the challenge for you is to make a mask wallet for your family members, right? I mentioned to you the instructions will be shared with you on SLS, okay? And after making that mask wallet, right, we do our part by not littering and uh, to preserve this biodiversity, okay? But also another important part is that we need more people to join us so that our impact can be greater. So as you make a mask wallet, after you want to pass to them, before that, share with them how littering is harming the biodiversity around us. You can even share with them some of the interesting animals that you have seen uh, in today's talk and share with them that actually if we litter, if uh, things are then being used and then uh, not disposed of properly, they can affect their lives as well. Okay, and if you like this uh, upcycling task, you can always look for other ways to upcycle. So for, for example, you can use toilet rolls, toilet rolls to make a pen holder, tin cans for a plant pot, a uh, plastic bottle for a uh, piggy bank, okay? So if you, right, the, if we have less litter, right, less of it will find its way to the ocean and we are doing our part. Well, one, one of the ways that we can do our part to preserve the biodiversity around us. And of course, we want to make our environment an even better place to live in. Okay, so don't forget that uh, this time we are supposed, we want to do our part Okay, so let the mask wallet remind you of the effort that you can do to prevent the, this from happening to the marine animals. Okay. All right, now the next part, we are going to share with you some projects. I know the P3s, you have done your magnet toys and tools. 
P4s, you are doing, and P4s and 5, you are doing your science investigative project. So many of you have submitted your projects, and today we have two groups who will be sharing with you their projects. Okay, so the first one will be uh, Travis Tan from 5 Endurance. So can I invite him to come and uh, uh, share his project with you? Hello, my name is Travis Tan from Primary 5 Endurance. Today, I will be talking to you about my science project. Does the amount of sugar affect the time an ice cream melts? My hypothesis is that the higher the amount of sugar, the faster the ice cream melts. These are the steps to conduct the experiment. Prepare three bowls. Cut the ice cream to same sizes. Weigh the ice cream until it's the same mass so it can be fair. Get a timer and set it five minutes. Put it in three bowls and wait for five minutes. Record the results. My only change variable was the sugar amount in all the ice cream. The variables I kept constant were the shape and size of the bowls, the amount of ice cream. I used three types of ice cream with different amounts of sugar. After five minutes, the ice cream all melted. I observed that the ice cream in setup B melted first, followed by C and A. The results did not support my hypothesis, although the ice cream was the lowest amount of sugar melted last. The ice cream with the highest amount of sugar did not melt first. Why did the ice cream with the least amount of sugar melt last? Sugar has the effect of lowering the freezing temperature of a solution. The more sugary ice cream will then have a lower melting temperature. It will also melt faster at room temperature than the less sugary ice cream. Other than sugar, there are other factors that affect how fast ice cream melts, such as the amount of fat content and other ingredients used. As the ice cream have used other ingredients, they could have affected how fast the ice cream melts. The most challenging part was when I needed to cut the ice cream, as I needed to be fast so the ice cream will not melt before the experiment even started. To improve the project, I have to keep the type of ice cream used to be the same and only change the amount of sugar in each of the ice cream to ensure that the other ingredients do not affect how fast the ice cream melts. We have come to the end of my presentation. I hope you like it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Travis. Okay, so you can see sometimes science investigation does not always uh, get results that we expected. Okay, so although he did not, his result did not support his hypothesis, he learned new things about it. So we can see that science investigation can generate new questions. Then uh, he has found new ways to improve such that the next experiment will be a fairer test. Okay, now we have uh, Pugazini and uh, Ashrita from Five Graciousness who will be sharing with us another project. Can you guys any please? Good morning teachers and friends. Today we are delighted to share our science investigative project. I'm Pugarini and this is Ashrita. We 
Sophia from Five Graciousness. Our investigative project was based on an observation that we made. We wondered how rainbows are formed. From our observation and research, we decided on an aim for investigation, as we know that a prism can cause white light to split into different colors. Our aim is to find out if the angle light reaches a prism affects the splitting of light into different colors. We think that the angle would affect the splitting of light into different colors. While planning our experiment, we decided on these variables to change, measure, and to keep constant. We have to make sure we conduct the experiment at the same location and time as the sun is our light source. And doing it at different times would cause the amount of light to be different. We used the sun as the light source for our experiment and performed the following steps. We held a prism with the flat surface facing the sun. We observed the effects of the splitting of light on the ground as light passes through the prism. For our second reading, we rotated the prism such that the edge faces the sun. We also observed the effects of light splitting on the ground as light passes through the prism. To ensure the reliability of our results, we repeated the experiment using another prism. In both experiments, we got similar results. For our first reading, when the flat surface of the prism faces the sun, we observed that light was split into different colors. For our second reading, when the edge of the prism faces the sun, we observed that the light remained white in color. From our results, we conclude that the splitting of light into different colors depends on the angle light reaches the prism. Now, let me present Ashrita to continue the rest. White light is made of different colors of light. When white light enters an object with a different density, different colored lights change direction as they travel at different speeds. This is known, in, known as refraction. As the different colored lights passes through the prism, they change direction again. This causes the different colors to appear at different locations, which is what we observe. However, white light may not split into different colors as the light does not pass through the prism, but is reflected. This is known as total internal reflection. From our experiment, we are able to observe how rainbows are formed. As sunlight reaches the earth, they are scattered by the water droplets into the different colors when it reaches our eyes. We see rainbows more often in the evening as the angle of the sunlight increases the chances of a rainbow forming and also because afternoon showers are more common. As our science lab only had an opaque prism and we needed to use a glass prism to conduct our experiment. And sometimes the sun was not shining brightly and we spent a lot of time to figure out the right light source. Other than a prism, we can use other methods to form a rainbow too. You can look at the different methods when you view our project on SLS. Hope you had fun through our presentation. Please work for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pogazini, uh, Asrita, as well as Travis. I hope that you have uh, you, you have enjoyed their presentation. Of course, uh, this is not the end of it. I'm going to share with you uh, more details. Okay, give me a while. Let me share with you. Okay, so just now you, you have heard uh, Asrita mentioning 
that you can view their project on SLS. Okay, let me share with you the slides first. Okay, all right. So what is going to happen during your September holidays? This is not the end of the carnival, right? It's going to continue. And of course, there are many more projects from the P4s and 5s that you can go and view on SLS. Okay, we do not have the time, unfortunately, for all of them to present to you. But you can see there are many interesting ideas, right, from the P4s. Right? And of course, there are more than this. I have just highlighted some of them. Right, the P5s as well. Okay, some of the things included to COVID, whether it's soap or hand sanitizer more effective. Okay, and of course, not forgetting our P3s with their wonderful ideas of the magnetic tools or magnetic tools and toys. Okay, like Spider-Man wannabe sets. Okay, social distance soccer. Magnetic dress up. A magnetic key organizer. Okay, so you, you are interested, right? The confused magnet, right? Even a magnetic theme park. You can see that there are many magnetic toys inside the theme park. Homo polar motor, right? And combining math and science, right? Madness of multiplication, right? How they use magnets, right? If we are talking about upcycling, right? They can just make use of simple magnets they can find at home to make toys that they can use uh, to entertain themselves. Okay, and of course, at the same time, learn more about magnets. Okay, and Gopher Tree Challenge has a wide variety of F1 cars, as you can see from these pictures. Okay, so this carnival, the, all these projects and more will be assigned to you during the September holidays. Right? That will take place next week. Okay, log into SRS and to view the project. And of course, you can get some ideas and you can even uh, make your own magnet toys uh, to, to play during the September holidays. Okay, and we want you to vote for your favorite project. Right, for each level, P3, P4, and P5. So you actually have three votes. Uh, but in order for your votes to be counted, there will be a reflection that you have to complete. Okay, very simple reflection after you have viewed the projects. Okay, and the voting will end on the 13th of September. And then, uh, of course, we will announce the results to you in term four. Okay, so I hope that you have enjoyed the, the doing the mask wallet as well as the presentations from your peers. Uh, right now, I'd like to pass to Manuel Aquila, who will be sharing with you uh, some of the exhibits that they have uh, that they have you have done during your virtual environmentalist. Okay, Manuel Aquila, please. Okay, good morning boys and girls. So I'm here today to present to you some of the projects that were done during our SNS lessons. So over the last few months during your home-based learning as well as right now, some of us have been actively participating in the science programs in SLS, all right, namely the family science. This was uh, given to you during the May holidays as well as the reason for the PSLE uh, oral examination days uh, this lesson on virtual environmentalists was rolled out to all the P1s until P5s. So today I'm going to show you some of the responses that our friends in the different levels have done. And uh, let's all get together to applaud their very good works, okay? So the first one that you're seeing right now is for the family science. So for family science, each level had to do a different project. So our P1s were, le uh, were learning about giraffes and they actually did some interesting models on uh, how to make models of giraffes, as well as they were encouraged to share their zoo experiences. So some of them were very nicely uh, writing about their experiences and showing us pictures of what they had done with their family members previously before the circuit breaker. So this was a very good effort by our P1 pupils and they shared this in SLS with uh, the teachers. So well done to our P1 pupils. The next one were the P2s who had to do a fizzy balloon experiment. So this was very interesting for them as well. 
right? So they had to make use of uh, the things, items found in the kitchen to come up with a fizzy balloon experiment. And uh, most of them, when they shared with the teachers, they said that they had very good time learning about chemical reactions. Okay, the next one for primary trees, all right, the P trees did some ex uh, experiments about lava in a cup where they learned about density. So some of them shared very interesting photographs with us as well. So these are some of your friends who have done these uh, experiments at home. And they also tried to make their own versions at home as well. So good job. Okay, NLP force for the family science, you all did the catapult, the rubber band catapult. They learned about Leonardo da Vinci's uh, interesting invention about the rubber band catapult and they made their own versions. And some of them had fun actually coming up with their videos on this as well. Like for example, this one here, which I'm going to show you, okay, where he had fun. Tzu Hong from Endurance, for Endurance, was actually playing with his own uh, catapult toy at home and he was talking about the science behind it. So good job. Okay, so following that, Recently, we did our virtual environmentalist lesson. Now, this lesson is an ongoing lesson. So, for those of you who have not completed your lesson on water conservation, you can still do this over the September holidays and you can give back to our community on what you have learned about saving water. All right? So, some of the activities of, to showcase their learning, pupils were encouraged to make posters. So a lot of us, a lot of our pupils put in a lot of effort to come up with creative posters. So these are the posters done by our P1 friends and our P2 friends. Okay, you can see that they actually showcase their learning by uh, writing about the five water saving tips or some of the tips that are very easy for them to follow. And these are easily seen in the posters. So these are done by our P3 pupils. Very nice and colorful. And our P4s were also actively doing these posters as well. Some of them even use digital posters to make using their iPads. They did their digital, digital artwork. And our P5s, all right? And uh, some of them actually came up with their own rap, all right, about water saving tips. So I think all of this shows that our pupils are very creative and they like to showcase their learning in different ways. So keep up the good work, boys and girls. Okay, so some of the activities in the virtual environmentalist program involved you to actually illustrate the water cycle. So these are some of the works done by all our pupils. Now, one of the activities is also about how you can make your own videos to talk about how to save water. So these are some pupils from the different classes who actually talk to their siblings, they make their own videos and they were talking about what else can we do to save water. So I would like to use this opportunity to say very good job from all these pupils. Now, we may not have time to watch all their videos today. I will show you one of the videos first. Okay, let's watch a video by this pupil from Paul Gallantry. Okay, I think, are we able to hear? Okay, never mind. So what we are going to do, okay, what we are going to do is to share this project with SLS so that you can actually view your friends' videos that they have made. So some of them are actually very interesting. They actually talk to their own friends uh, with safe distancing, of course, some of them with their siblings living in the same house and they made the videos together. So we will showcase all this in SLS as well as play this in our school during HSV, during our lunch breaks. So you can actually step by and uh, look at their performances, look at what they have to say about what saving water, right? Now, I would like to use this opportunity to thank all of these pupils, all of you. There were actually many more entries, but we were not able to show everybody's posters and uh, videos today, right? But I think all of us have learned that when you are given a task in SLS, many of you have actually put in a lot of effort to do up the projects. So good job. Keep the responses coming in. Okay, so remember learning never stops. So whatever you have learned in the lessons, please continue to share with your friends and your family members. 
and don't forget to make it as part of your life. So the water conservation lesson is not just about doing up posters and, and forgetting about it. But what's important is how you adopt the different ways to save water and how you can actually do your part to conserve water. If all of us do our part, then I'm sure that the, we will be doing a long way to uh, stop this problem about water wastage in our society. Okay, so thank you for listening. I will pass the time back to Mrs. Chong. Hi everyone, we have come to an end of Science Carnival 2020. Science Department hope that you had a wonderful time and till next time we meet again, hopefully face to face this time. We hope you stay calm and enjoy HSP. Goodbye.